Welcome to the Great Girlfriends Podcast, where we discuss life, love, laughter, and everything in between. I actually got that right. <laughs> I've been jacking it up. We're your hosts. I'm Sybil Amudi. And I'm Brandis Daniel. And thank you guys for joining us today. Yes. Like, it's been hard for us to get recorded, guys, because we've been having all these side podcast oh my conversations. God. God, we, we have had an hour's worth of side <laughs> podcast conversations. And we probably should have been recording it. We but, probably should have been. But you know what? It was like, it, we couldn't put that stuff out there. No. I probably would have had a long <laughs> night at home. So exactly. we go keep this recording going. So what's been going on in your world? So let's see. So I'm past, I'm post fashion week now, Woo-hoo! which is awesome. And I'm excited about that. Um, I got some great news that I have not shared with the great girlfriends or on my Instagram. And that was um, New York Magazine actually did a feature on me. Oh, I, yes. I'm, okay, okay. I haven't even posted that. <sighs> I know. Ugh. So girlfriends, when you get a chance... Ugh. Check that out. I'll post it. I just thought about it. Just I was like, I should have shared that with the great yes. girlfriend. Um, and baby love is growing and is moving now as yeah. we speak. Um, before this podcast, I was telling Sybil how the baby was moving and she got a chance to feel yes. baby love she stretching. Gave me a little tap, little tap dance real yeah. quick. And, um, and everything <laughs> is going good. I mean, Rich is doing well. We're just getting ready to be parents and... Mm. That's a whole nother show too. I like, know. can you ever be ready enough? Ooh, I don't, I don't girl. know. I don't know, but we just, we've just been kind of talking about it more and just trying to get ourselves to a place where we're, you know, ready. Uh huh. As best as ready as, as you can be. As best as we can be. As best as we can be. So. Cause yeah. you, you're ready. And then comes the baby. Then comes the baby. And then and we then- <laughs> comes like all of the all of the dynamics that come with the baby like all of that part yeah what's been going on with you brand building nice i have been brand building brandis and it's interesting because i spent like i said i spent so many time so much time on other people's brands that um now making this investment this summer into my personal brand feels so rewarding it feels, I mean, when I tell you, honestly, I'm seeing the benefit of it just in terms of some opportunities that have come my way. Um, some of the exposure that I'm able to get with other brand relationships that I had that nice. people didn't know what my passions were for sure. And once okay. I opened the door to some of that, just some doors that have opened have been dynamic. And I think it's going to make 2016 very exciting. Yeah. I'm it excited is. about I'm excited about next year too. I am. And my little boo-boo, my dilly. Oh my God. My okay, so dilly. wait a minute. You, gotta t- you have to tell our girlfriends about the story about the dress. <laughs> okay, guys. So I have this dress. I think it's the cutest it's dress. Cute. It's so it, cute. It's just so cute. It's like a fun, flirty, um, it's got like a mock collar, a sleeveless, white with like safety pins all over it's it. It's so cute. It's really cute, right? And I got it from a boutique in Soho. I got this dress like four weeks ago and I have probably worn it like four times, which for me, I don't really wear the same stuff over and over again. So my daughter, I came downstairs and my daughter says to me, mommy, how many times are you going to wear that dress? <laughs> And I'm looking at my little four-year-old daughter like, you got some nerve. The shade. The shade. <laughs> oh, the shade that comes from a four-year-old. And I feel like, I was like, Dylan, you wear your little striped polo dress three days a week, easy, and I never say a word. So how dare she come for me like that? Right. And she's worn that little dress so much that it's a tunic now. That, that little she gotta wear biker shorts with it. It's so she's drunk to that degree. So how could she be on me like that? That is hilarious. Yeah, and she has a she has a, a drum pad now. So oh, nice. she walks around the house beatboxing, and she's like, mm, 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 mm. Uh. like she comes up with beats. Oh wow! And she's really good. Oh wow! Girl, I know she you is like some, you got some little artiste on your hands. Yes, girl. Oh, and Sam was on today last week. I think I told. Oh. You. Yay. He's so, a, so Sybil's son. My little boo. My he, Sam. He is a regular on the Today Show. He is. He's a part of a series called Kid Vice. If you guys want to look it up on today.com, it's called Kid Vice. And he just, um, they ask kids questions, advice um, from the perspective of a child. So this particular segment was on emojis and what do they mean or how the kids interpret mm-hmm. them. And it was very fun to see 
what how we interpret things and how kids see them. Oh wow! Yeah, so that's gonna be coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, it'll by the time you guys hear this, it'll be out. Okay. okay. Yeah. So nice. Fun stuff. nice. Yeah, girl. Well, our topic today. Today, 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 we are gonna talk about. Um, we're gonna dig back into entrepreneurship. And, you know, we're going to talk about five signs that you're ripe for entrepreneurship. That's a good one. It's really good, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the reason why we're diving into this is because um, when we did the truth about entrepreneurship, we literally just kind of braised the surface. We did. Yeah. There's so much more to talk about. We can do like 20 podcasts on that. It is. Seriously. Because there is like a psychology, a mindset that goes along with the person that can be an entrepreneur and thrive at it. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah, so it's it's one thing to kind of, you know, dabble in entrepreneurship and then say, you know, I'm considering starting a business. I think I want to do this on the side. And it's another thing to dive all the way in, like fully immersed in it and make a lifestyle out of it. Absolutely. So, like, Sybil, how do you know that you were ready for entrepreneurship or when did you know like have you I, no i know and i'm like not even letting you answer the no no it's good but like did you like is that something that you thought you would be when you were in college like did you say i'm gonna be an entrepreneur i have always I, my parents I let my bless my parents i have always had a very independent mind okay um and it's probably been to a detriment at times <laughs> But I've always had an um, entrepreneurial vein of some sort. Like, okay. literally, my first job was raking leaves around the neighborhood with a flyer. Are you serious? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> because my parents, like, if one thing they gave us for sure, it's work ethic. Okay. And they made sure that we understood, like, you know, for my parents, for my dad, it's about working hard. For me, it's about working smart. Right. My dad's generation was work hard. Right. And it pays off. Me, I'm like, we got enough innovation and technology we can work smart absolutely use our resources and get to places that our parents would have had to work hard at so starting from raking leaves that is so funny i would love to see what me and my (laughs) sisters i mean in the cold my mom would layer our hands with socks or gloves Uh, and we would go out and rake and we would charge per bag wow yep we would hit every every fall when the neighbors when the leaves started falling the neighbors knew the clark girls are coming (laughs) <laughs> yep yep and then, that's so funny too because i don't think in you know you would think that would be like little boys but not no girls. three wow. girls out there and my my two cousins would come my, my boy cousins they would come sometimes but it okay. was our business but we actually didn't want them to come because that was cutting the profit yeah <laughs> <laughs> so we were not about cutting those profits and then i mean i sold candy at school okay i always like from like probably fourth grade up to uh, you know maybe middle school i sold candy on the side That's so hilarious. i was always selling now and laters i uh-huh. was selling jolly ranchers uh super bubble gum things like that babysitting i would babysit anybody's child <laughs> like i started babysitting when i was about 10 11 i started with my little cousins i was good at that I, then I would go to church babies and I worked in the nursery at the church. Uh-huh. I volunteered. So people started to see me get familiar uh-huh. and then it started in the weekend jobs and then it started oh, to wow. full term summer gigs. I have been working as long as I know. Wow. So I think it was from there into Baskin Robbins in high school from, and I sold magazines over the phone. Wow. I have, I have worked, I was in telemarketing in college. Uh-huh. I worked at uh, Banana Republic in college you know, I have always had um, ethic around work. Okay. And passion around what work. What you did. Right, I've right. always, even if it was like raking leaves, my mom taught us to be excellent at it, mm-hmm. you know? And so whatever it was, I always knew that I needed to be very good at it. Right. So I needed to invest like passion in it and I needed to do it consistently and, and aggressively. So like for me i entrepreneurship my dad was an entrepreneur my mom was not but my mom was very savvy around sources of income okay so my mom has always had multiple streams of income wow always wow <laughs> to this wow. day <laughs> she's always believed in creating streams and she taught that to us so that sort of idea that i needed to thrive in terms of like work ethic and income was mm-hmm. always there what, um, what other things your mom do? 
my, my, my mom was a teacher for many years. We did the census when the census came okay. around. Like, we mean it. I was in the car uh-huh. with my mom. I, girl, I would take a quarter from wherever I could get it from. Uh-huh. So my mom would do the census. Uh, and then she had some investment, uh, real estate okay. and some other stuff that. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. So How about you? How did you know um, that entrepreneurship was something you were interested in? I think it's been, I think I, I've known that I wanted to be an entrepreneur for a really long time. Mm-hmm. And mine, like yours, kind of started a lot from a childhood, mm-hmm. actually. We sold freeze cups. Y'all know what ah, freeze cups yes! are? <laughs> and a little white spiral. Yes! Bowl, the Kool-Aid cups. Kool-Aid, yes, How girl. How much were your freeze cups? I don't remember. I think okay. they were like 25 cents or something like that. They nice were really price. cheap. Yeah. <laughs> And um, and that worked until we got Kool-Aid all over my mom's freezer. Uh And she was like, "Uh, business is shut down. (laughs) So then we sold lemonade to, so my next door neighbor played basketball in the backyard. Oh, okay. So we sold lemonade over the fence to his friends. Oh my gosh, I love it. That's so good. Lazy, right? (laughs) Built the uncomfortable face. Right over the side, right over the side. I love that. So we did that. (laughs) That's so cute. And then, um, other than that, I would just say, like, my dad is has been, like, a serial entrepreneur mm-hmm. through the years. And kind of watching his grind and seeing how he worked. And he always felt like every business he started was a family affair. Mm. So, girl, 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 <laughs> well, I know girl, about the family girl. Affair. <laughs> so, my Saturdays, most of the time, were spent passing out flyers. <laughs> my dad believed in a good flyer. Yes. Girl. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, we passed out flyers to every business he had, for every business he had. Oh, my gosh. And you we passed out a flyer today. Girl. You did. Oh, did. <laughs> so wait. <laughs> wait a minute. Passing out flyers is in your blood. <laughs> it is. <laughs> okay, you gotta tell the story. Oh my gosh. So we went to lunch today before I we started recording. <laughs> And we met these beautiful great girlfriends who were going to post their picture on Instagram. And as we were leaving, Brandis is introducing them to HFR and she gives them a program from this past show. And she said her niece, Dee Dee, always gets on her about how she's passing out these big old programs. And I was like, you, it's like passing out tracks in the, in the Christian community. Sure enough, you passing out, that's the equivalent to your dad passing out a flyer. Do you know I have never thought about that <laughs> ever? That's where you get it from. Where I get it. I'm so embarrassed. That is exactly where That's I get hilarious. it. So okay, so that was I had never put two and two together ever. That was an aha ever, moment. ever, ever. But so my dad would have us passing out flyers. Uh-huh. That was our Saturday thing, and he would wow. bribe us with like, oh, we'll go get hamburgers after. He pay us our money. So he would feed you, which is what he was supposed to do. Girl. But you had a you had a meal, you ate yeah, Burger King. Or exactly. <laughs> um, and so that's kind of like that was like my introduction, I think, to entrepreneurship. Nice. It's like you want customers, you go get customers. Yeah. yeah. They not coming to you, you know. Yeah. That's so true. But you know, I I will say this. I never sort of desired entrepreneurship. It's not been that for me. It's been wanting to create change and wanting to do it in a way that I know can get results. And sometimes it's internal to a company. Right. And sometimes it's not. Because sometimes you're in a stage. um, I've been at companies before where my thoughts or my decisions weren't trusted necessarily. Mm. So I wasn't able to influence change in a way that I thought could be valuable or that I knew could be valuable. Right. And sometimes that happens where you're like, well, you know what? I need to create a space where this type of decision making or leadership or idea can be replicated, can be, you know, can be uh, right. introduced to people. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Sometimes that kind of, and that for me was like a twinge of what has kept me um, connected to like entrepreneurship and startups and even helping other entrepreneurs get their ideas busted out the ground and right. like moving. Cause right. I want them to know that if they put a really great plan behind it, it can be successful. Right. Yeah. Plan. No. I'm sorry. That's my, that's, that's, that's my, my that, word. That's your word. That's your word. <laughs> um, but so let's get into like the five signs 
of entre- entrepreneurship. Right. So so there's thousands of them. There's but... there are thousands of them. Yeah, yeah, there are and and emotions. We might have yes. another separate conversation and, you know, resources that make it go well. Yeah. Yeah, cuz they're like key people you need in your corner and so forth. We talked a little bit about that on the truth of entrepreneurship, but yeah. um we feel like, you know, there are there are some core questions that you should be asking or signs that you should uh, be taking from the following questions that we have. So the first one, Brandis, I think is you you killed it with this. I think the first one is, are you an entrepreneur on your job? Mm. And And so what do you mean by that? (laughs) You heard how I said that. (laughs) So, I mean, the thing is I was simple and I had a little bit of a side conversation about this. And I said, you can always kind of tell if someone's an entrepreneur based on how they operate in their job. So if you're somebody who basically does everything somebody tells you, then I'm not sure if you cut out to be an entrepreneur. But if you're somebody who you see how something can be done better and you're constantly contributing in a way to your current company that you're working for as if it's your own business. Yeah you probably have what it takes to be an entrepreneur. And you can go back. I mean, when Sybil and I were kind of talking through this, I mean, you can think back through, like, your first job and how you treated that to maybe the job that you have now. Um, I remember when I started working for International Intimates, my last company that I worked for, when I got there, I realized they didn't have any processes and procedures in place around almost anything. Mm -hmm. And I came in and I felt like it was my responsibility, even though that wasn't my job title. Yeah. I said, it's my responsibility to actually create these processes and mm-hmm. procedures. Mm-hmm. And so I would stay after work late just filing away stuff. Because mm-hmm. that was the first phase to getting it together. Right. And, wow. um, and so I just think that it was this thing of if I'm going to be here and doing this job, I really want it to be done well. Yeah. So there's like the mindset of an internal owner versus an internal operator. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there there are owners. Let's yeah. be clear. There are the owners. Like, you know, if you work at, uh, you know, Prudential, for example, just because I'm looking at a Prudential candle here. But if you work at Prudential and you're an owner, uh, you know, uh, literally the, the corporation owner, that's one thing because you, you do have like primary or leading um, authority over what takes place in the building. But if you're within a department, say you're within, uh, you know, accounts receivable and you're on a team and you're given some clear set tasks that um, are critical to helping the team create outcomes, you're an internal owner of that specific piece to the puzzle. Right. So you have to really, and it's like, it's different for someone to just operate, which means they just move things along, kind of like an assembly line. Right. And even on that, there takes a sense of ownership to get the precision right on an assembly line. So it's even like, okay, let's use that example of an assembly line, right? Mm -hmm. So the person to me who's entrepreneurial will look at the processes of an assembly line and say, you know what? I think we can do it better, faster Mm -hmm. this way. Mm -hmm. And then take that idea to management and explain to them how these things right here would make that idea better and faster. Um, It's like, I don't know, you mentioned even going back to when you worked at Baskin Robbins. Mm -hmm. I mean, you mentioned on Mm -hmm. the side note, not on the podcast, but... Yeah, so I worked at Baskin Robbins from 16 to 18, all of high school, and it was my first, like, on the books job. And I mean, I started out, you know, just scooping ice cream and I loved it because I loved ice cream. One, I was passionate about ice cream and and all the freebies that came along with it. But I really loved like all that I was responsible for. The smile on people's faces when they got that ice Mm -hmm. cream, knowing that like I had regular people that wanted me to make their banana split. Little Uh things like that say, you killing that banana split. Uh And that's small, but that significance around that accomplishment made me know that when I do something well... People are rewarded by it. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Th- those little things matter and they go a long way. But to the point that um, as a teenager to be trusted by our managers, and I was not a manager, but I was the most trusted team leader to close a shop at night and to be there to help manage with friends. And like, we're all working together at Baskin Robbins and um, we got keys to close the place. That, that for me said a lot about the sense of ownership that I brought to that environment. Right. I felt like, I was responsible for all of the outcomes. 
and I was not an owner, but I was an internal owner. So I didn't just operate, which means to me, when you're just operating in something, you don't look to influence the, uh, the, uh, capabilities or the performance of it. You're just maintaining it. And that is something I talk to my interns about all the time. I have six interns that I work with every single day for Harlem's Fashion Row. And I'm always telling them that the thing that will set you apart is thinking. Yes, yes. And like anybody can find somebody to do. Finding a mm. doer, a really good doer, that's, that's not, not hard. hard. That's no. not hard. But to find somebody who's a thinker, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is difficult. Yeah. And that is, I mean, that's a challenge. Honestly, I've had since day one with like interns. Like they will do, 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 do. But there are, but thinking through it and thinking about how this impacts that yeah. and bringing that to my attention mm -hmm. or even thinking about new opportunities and new ideas or easier ways that we can do things. If I had a person like that, and I do have a couple interns that are, are really good and are getting there, but when you make yourself that person, you make yourself invaluable mm -hmm. to an organization. Yeah. Like... I mean, that is when somebody is like, okay, like the last job I had, I mean, I was getting promoted every six months for the yeah. most part. Mm -hmm. And when I got ready to leave that job, and I know this is about entrepreneurship, but when I got ready to leave that job, they offered me um, six weeks off. They offered me to come back in a new position Wow. with less work, mm -hmm. with more pay. Mm-hmm. And, and they knew it would be less work. They're like, we want your pay. internal ownership at a higher and, level. <laughs> and it was just like, it was like, we yeah. don't want to let you go because we know that you're one of the people in our company who are thinking about this and you're owning this. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you've got somebody on your team that's owning it, it makes you feel better because you feel like, dang it, I don't have to hold all the balls in exactly. the air. Exactly. Somebody else or is making sure. Or if I miss it, somebody somebody gonna else it. gonna catch the yeah, ball for yeah, me. Yeah. I don't have yeah. to. That's how I am now. It's yeah. like if I got people on my team and I feel like they helping me keep these balls in the air. Yeah. Girl, I can just breathe lighter. You don't want to let them yeah. go. Yeah. And I think that is the quality that if you have that quality and you want to be an entrepreneur most likely that's a sign that you're going to be a successful entrepreneur. And that's actually another key sign too. A lot of times when you are ripe for entrepreneurship, it, just to the point of if you're an entrepreneur in your job, it's like people don't want to let you go. People don't want to let you go. <laughs> they want to find a way to promote, 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 to keep you, to raise you up, to meet your needs, to get, to keep you fulfilled because they understand your value and they want to c continue to have the benefit of that on their team. Absolutely. So, yeah. So, you know, you can see, um, you can see that internally. That's a key sign that you're taking ownership and your thought leadership is valuable and that it's making a mark. Absolutely. Number two um, was me, I was saying, my question was, do you have a clear picture of what you'd like to accomplish? And for me, that means, do you know what it is that you want to see done when you are an entrepreneur? Is it something where you just want to work for yourself? It, 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 that, which could sometimes be yeah. a start place, but it's, it's a death. It's almost like a, to me, a deathly start place because Working for yourself is a hard job, and it's I don't the think people hardest get job. <laughs> just, Girl, working just for, what goes into it. Working for a check, working for somebody would be so much easier than what I do. Because there's so many guarantees that you oh, that you have God. in place yes. when other people are handling accounting, oh. help, handling benefits, handling operations, handling uh, you know, all the vision planning, yes. all of that, and you're just you know operating internally, but. Do you know what it is that entrepreneurship will do for you or what you intend to do as an entrepreneur? Like, you know, in this particular season of my entrepreneurship, when I was leaving the company that I was at, I was very clear on what it was that I needed to focus on. Like I was very, 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 very sure that my entrepreneurship in this stage needed to be dedicated towards investing in the legacy of my, com my family, which ultimately means started with me. So that was something that I was certain of. And yes. I knew, I also knew the core approaches that I needed to take. And not everybody knows that, but I would encourage people not to do that soul searching without <laughs> your own dime. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I would encourage people to explore or identify, like locate that passion and how they want to accomplish it before they step out. Absolutely. Because 
when you're out on your own, which this is almost like a wilderness experience because there aren't as many nets as what you no. have when you're at a company. But when you're out here, there is, you know, you have your own voice that you're dealing with. You have, you know, the world that you're up against or that you feel is against you or that you have to go it's, out and approach. It's literally like this. It's like being in a backyard pool and navigating that backyard pool. So you, you've got like the three feet, you've got the six feet, you've got the mm-hmm. eight feet, right? Mm-hmm. So you know that, you know, the eight feet might be where you want to go. And maybe yeah. after that, you want to get on a diving board, mm-hmm. right? But there's a lot of structure yes. around that backyard pool. That's true. Okay. Then <laughs> you leave that backyard pool to go in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Mm. And you've got the Atlantic Ocean where you've got sharks in there. You've got all kind of species you don't know about that's there. You got times when you can't see land because yeah. there's nothing but water around you. Very true. You got sometimes where you might see a tree out the out the out the ocean and you try to hold on to that tree and you realize that that tree wasn't stable <laughs> because it's got all this water around it. Yeah. And there are no boats to be found at yeah. times or maybe sometimes there's a boat but it's too far for you to get to. Mm-hmm. So it's like leaving a backyard pool. And going and into, into the Atlantic. That's so good. And that is not, you know, that's... Yeah, you can't do that without strategy. You, you have need, to have some insight. You need to... Or you either need to have in, insight. Sybil is a planner. <laughs> Sybil is a planner. Uh, so she's right. You do. You but I would tell wise. you, I didn't have strategy or a plan. You did. You had I enough didn't. start kickstart. But what stuff. I but what I what I did have, I didn't I didn't I really didn't, honestly. I didn't. You knew what you wanted to accomplish. You but, knew HFR. But I knew I had a I had a purpose. Right. And you knew what you want to accomplish. Well that's and, yeah. I had a purpose. I didn't know what I want to accomplish yeah. on a on a global large scale, yeah. right? But I didn't have a plan to get there. And no, no. I had some proof mm-hmm. that I had some proof after doing two events mm-hmm. and having two years right. that this was something viable. Right. That other people wanted it to. Mm-hmm. So I think that gave me enough, what do you call it, huspa? The huspa. <laughs> yeah. Huspa. <laughs> <laughs> To leave the backyard pool and go out into the ocean, but it was hard. Yeah. But at least you knew going in that you had a mission in mind. Yeah, I did. You had a mission. It wasn't just, I'm done with this. I'm sick of a nine to five. How many times do we hear people say, I am sick of a nine to five. And I told this girl just last week, I said, if you were doing what you love, from nine to five, the hours would not matter. That's so, so true. It's not a nine to five that you're sick of. You're sick of not fulfilling your passion. That's yeah. different. Yeah, that's but, true. But saying that I'm sick of corporate, you're not sick of corporate because if your entrepreneur dream turns into a corporation, you're not sick of that. No, that's true. So you're not, it's not that you are sick of corporate or you're sick of a nine to five. You are unfulfilled at what you're doing. You don't that's have true. a mission in mind. That's true. You know what I mean? Because the but minute you let 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 your company blow up, no, we got a cap on this. We can't do corporate. Yeah. And it has to be an overnight company because she doesn't like nine to five. Yeah. And she doesn't like corporations. Yeah. No. That's so That's, true. Those things are those are those are things that we tell ourselves to kind of cope with the idea that we're centered around what we want to do, but the structure is just not right for us. When the truth of the matter is, the structure would be quite all right if it was our own. Or if our mission was being fulfilled. I agree. I completely agree. Yeah. So you have to know what it is you'd like to accomplish. Absolutely. Uh, Number three is, do you want to leave your job out of frustration? Which is kind of what you just talked about. Do you want to leave your job out of frustration with the work environment or because there is an unfulfilled passion? So that's basically what Sybil Mm -hmm. just said. I mean, I won't reiterate it. It's It's the same thing you just said. Like, you you know what? I'm sick of this job. You know, I'm sick of coming into these work. I'm going to start my own thing. Or my well, manager. You know what? That's fine. Um, if you want to start your own thing. But like Sybil just said, if you don't have kind of a clear goal and a clear purpose in mind, mm-hmm. 
are you going to have the strength to actually build the boat that you're going to need to be able to survive in the ocean? Absolutely. (laughs) Or if you have people dynamics that don't fit you, like I can't stand the people I work with. I don't like my manager. My manager doesn't like me. So I want to leave. If you're feeling like rejected or put out by people, that's not going to work in entrepreneurship either because you have to work with people as an entrepreneur that you would never drink coffee with or you would never, you wouldn't want to be at the water machine with. That's so true. And you're going to need so many people to help you. Exactly. But you learn as an entrepreneur how to make everyone your ally somehow. Yeah. Like you find camaraderie in something yes. as an entrepreneur. I love that. Story. Yeah, That's you a great do. Tweet. That's a tweetable moment. That's true. Number four is, do you go above and beyond on your current job? Are you outstanding? <laughs> You know, we can't mention that. That was which we number did. one. Yeah, but it, it just to go back to it, going above and beyond, being outstanding, being outstanding is that core piece to it. Yeah. If you're not outstanding now, there's a strong chance that you won't be outstanding as an entrepreneur. Yeah, because guys, and I, I like hate it. I used to hate when people talk about stuff like this. Like even now, as I'm pregnant, like oh, when people talk about motherhood and they're like. You know, girl, when that baby's born, <laughs> honestly, there's a piece of me that's like, yeah, but you're not Brandis. Like, uh, of course. There's a, there's yeah. a little, you're not a superhero. There's you a, don't know me. There's, <laughs> a, there's a little piece of me because I will push myself to the brink. I remember Will Smith said something. He was like, if me and you are on the treadmill together, he was like, you might be smarter than me. You might be faster than me. He was like, but you're never going to out. Outrun what is me. out me out, outrun me or you're not you're never gonna have as much tenacity as me he was like because i'll it. die on a treadmill uh, I and love it. when he said that i was like mm. i feel like i'll die on a treadmill yeah yeah and <laughs> so where did i where, where did i even come from that i don't What's know about but anyway, being outstanding um so i don't like when people started talking about oh it's so hard to be an entrepreneur but the truth is it is yeah the truth is it is not, it is hard. And so when you're not, like someone said, when you're not outstanding on what you're doing now, mm-hmm. when you get out here, and I have to keep using the ocean as an analogy because that's kind of what it's like because there's like no structure whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Like you have to create your own structure. Mm-hmm. When you get out there in that type of situation, it is so difficult. Yeah. And it's also being outstanding in a sense of knowing, you know, if you work in a current, say, nine to five, and you're leaving at 5.01, going home every day. Unless. And, what? Unless they've, they've started their own business on the side. Right. But even still, you have to be still be outstanding you and show That's yourself true. excellent. Like, I remember That's a true. stage where I was maintaining and during the day and building at night. Oh, you need to tell that. Yeah. Story. So I, you know, I believe in the principle of in order for you to prepare yourself for entrepreneurship, it's important that you maintain what it is your, you, you know, your current lifestyle or your current career base during the daytime. And you spend your nighttime building and starting like the foundational elements of what it is you want to do as an entrepreneur, like passion wise, how you want to, uh, you know, make your make your vision come alive in the world and like what will be essential to getting that, to making that happen. You might even start pulling resources and stuff. But I still had to work, you know, probably 10 hours at my current, my, my job job. Yeah. And another like five, four hours at night. Yeah. And I was sleeping like on five hours. So I had to take away from my sleep because I was like, I could sleep or I could build my future. Right. You know what I mean? I I could eat dinner, you know, at home or I could eat dinner here and let these people know how committed I am to their vision. Right. Because I'm going to want people to commit to my vision like that. It's true. So I can't be the type of person at 501, I'm rolling out. And then when I, when I get an intern and they leaving early, I'm throwing my hands up mad. Like, where you going? That's so true. You know what I'm saying? So it's being outstanding is, is even though, you know, you don't want to be there. You want to be in your own business, doing your own thing. It's so true. You're still there for a reason. And it's like, how can I, and to me, it's an outstanding person that can make the most out of that. Knowing like, I got this big vision that's brewing in my head, but I'm going to invest all of my energy and resources during the time that they have me here and prepare for my exit. You know what I'm saying? 
And I have a story around this too. Share. So when I was built, when I had Harlem's Fashion Row and I was working my full-time job, um, one of the things that helped me so much was that the person who was my assistant at the time, I, you know, I, I trained her from the beginning, but she was so supportive of me mm-hmm. that I was able to share with her about Harlem's Fashion Row. Mm-hmm. And because she was so supportive of me and I had that relationship was so strong, mm-hmm. her commitment was, she had a commitment to making sure that I succeeded at work. Mm-hmm. And so that was honestly what held me together for a very long time. Wow. So I would get into the office at like nine. She would get there at 730. She would have read all my emails. And I may have said this before. She would have read all my emails. Mm-hmm. And then she sent me one email with a link to all the emails I needed to address. Wow. So when I got into the office, I didn't have to look through all those yeah. emails. I didn't yeah. have to go through she 100. You time. Girl. <laughs> And so, mm. you know, I think those are the kind of things that can happen. But she also, for years, saw my commitment to my company, to International mm-hmm. Intimates. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think that though, and that's kind of, I mean, I didn't ask her to do that. Yeah. But I think that as an entrepreneur, you do need to have an impact and an influence on people so that they're willing to do things like yes. that. Yes, yes, Absolutely. Because you'll find that people will just rally around your vision yeah. and want to support you. Absolutely. When they see that you're absolutely outstanding. And that you care. Yeah. And that you treat them yeah. well. Like yes. that's, yeah. That you, you're you not just this, yeah. Yes. I mean, it works. It work. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to go to number, our last one. Which is five. Okay. Go ahead. And that's, um, are you willing to sacrifice the time money and personal interest in exchange for the investment in your business Mm -mm. you can't want to have it all all the time all the time there's some some spaces where weekends are going to be dedicated to research or weekends are going to be dedicated to networking or weekends or or late you know night times are going to be or vacation days are going to be dedicated to sourcing uh team you know technology and resources or you're just going to need to be studying or preparing somehow or actually producing something but it's not going to be it's not going to always be easy to want to have your time with your friends you know have a great dating relationship continue to maintain your job and be able to and be able to shop yeah yeah, I mean, when I started my business, there were ye- there were years that I did not buy anything. Yeah, yeah, years. Like all the money, all the, any any extra penny, quarters, nickels, dimes, yeah. dollars is going it into went, it went to my business. Yeah, and I yeah. almost felt and it, and honestly, I didn't really feel any kind of way about it. Yeah, I mean, to the point at which there was a time at which I had two pair of shoes and they both had holes at the bottom. Wow, and I refused to like cry about it mm-hmm, it was mm-hmm. just like oh well nobody knows but me like nobody would know that i had a hole at the bottom of my mm-hmm. shoe but me they were flat so wow. nobody there was like no way to know <laughs> if you down there you don't and, need to know. <laughs> and and but to me it was worth it yeah because you know i was i was very embarrassed when rich found them mm-hmm. very embarrassed and he was like we're going to get shoes <laughs> but there was times oh, the time no, Sybil, I'm going to put you on blast again. Oh, my gosh. So even, you know, Sybil knew that I was not going shopping. Oh. And I... there was one time we went to lunch, and I don't remember. I don't even remember what we were talking about, but. You were frustrated. I might have said to her that I have not even bought any new clothes in years. Yes. That's what you said. And... <laughs> you were like, I don't even have new clothes. And I was, and I got to the place where it was frustrating because, quite honestly, I was wearing the same thing, and I was. Talking about I was working in fashion business looking real busted. Yeah. And Sybil was like, come on. We so going let's to just Zara. go buy some clothes. So we literally, she took me to Zara and she was like, go pick out. Which you guys you can want. see. You guys can see why Sybil is so super blessed too. Because oh, she's such a giver. You. But she was like, go to Zara and get what you want. And so I still And have, she was skimping around was, in Zara. I was skimping. Like, checking tags and like. 
tiptoeing through trying to pick. I'm like, Brandis, get what you want now. Let get what I, you want. I had not gone all oh, down. But cry. that's me rallying around your vision. But you were I had, outstanding. I had not shopped in so long. I know. To the idea of buying full priced. And guys, I mean, we're talking Zara, so we're yeah. not. We're not. We're not talking. <laughs> yeah. Not talking Gucci. But, but at for that time, me, at yeah. the time. Shopping full price at Zara was a huge splurge that I was not willing to make at all because my money that I was making from my job that I was working was all going to HFR. Yeah, and the truth is, I wouldn't have shopped full price at Zara at that time. Wow. But it was for you to, it was for you. You needed to know that you deserve to do it, that you deserve mm-hmm. to be there. I wouldn't have been, I would have been like, well, I'll shop at so-and-so, or I would have found, you know, but it wasn't about that. What it was about was you knowing that the resources were available to you, that you deserve mm-hmm. to have them. Mm-hmm. You didn't have to sacrifice without, you weren't, with your sacrifice was going to be rewarded. Wow. You know what I mean? So, I mean, and that's for everyone to know that you will, there are sacrifices that you'll need to make because you're investing in your dream or you're investing into your legacy or, or whatever this vision is, the sacrifice comes with reward. It does. It does. And and sometimes you make those sacrifices and you have these incredible people like Sybil and Kwaku in your life. (laughs) I'm going to cry. Don't do it. (laughs) You know that will pour into you because of how much you sacrifice. People respect that. They respect it. You can't tell someone, you can't go to a bank and ask them for a loan for your business without them saying to you, how much of your own money have you invested? Have you invested? How much of your sweat equity have you invested? Oh, my boo-boo's crying. (laughs) How much of, of an investment have you made? And likewise, if you want to build a team around your vision, whatever this thing is that you seek out to do, you can't do it without telling them about the the amount of energy and and time and investment you've made. And not even they won't that, understand it. They all your team always have to know that you will do you go 10 harder. Times. Exactly. That you will go ten times. Yes. Then. Yes. Every single day during Fashion Week, I kept telling my interns who were all like 23, 24 years old, and they were so exhausted. And I was like, I don't understand why you guys are so tired. I'm mm-hmm. seven months pregnant. I'm almost 40 years old. And I can stay here another five hours if that's what it means to get it done. Yeah. You know, and it's like people have to see that in you. Like if you're going to attract really great people, people have to know that nobody is going to go harder than you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I remember one time I had a really, really great um, manager at a company I was working at. And all the firing was happening in the building. And I was like, Lord Jesus, am I next? Uh-huh. <laughs> I need this. I was in college and this was, gonna, this was paying for my apartment and all this other stuff. And I remember her coming to me and she said to me, I don't need you here. I don't need you here. Everything that you do, I can do. But I want you here because you've shown your commitment to me. And to this company. Wow. She was like, I, I don't want this team to be without your talent. Like, she made this very clear to me. Wow. She said, if I leave the building, I can trust you. Wow. And I'm, I mean, I'm a sales associate at Banana Republic making right. an hourly pay. But what I respected about what she said was that she said if she could leave, the, if she had to leave the building... She could trust me. Wow. And that made me know that, oh, I have really stepped up. Now, I'm a teenager. Right. But there's still certain ethical things that I was applying there at Banana Republic that I take everywhere I go. I refuse for people to think that you could leave this building without me holding it down. Right. Right. Like, down. Right. (laughs) Like, I got you. Like, you you don't have to look at it no more. You don't have to look at it. You don't have to worry. And that's what it's going to take, you know, in an entrepreneurial space is knowing that, you will hold yourself down. Like whatever the whatever the requirement is, if it's about learning some accounting so you know how to choose an accountant. Yeah, whatever You it know is. what I mean? Or if it's about learning about production so you can know how to choose the teams, you have to be willing to go above and beyond. And the truth is in entrepreneurship, you're always going to have a boss. 
Always. So that's so even true. Surprise. In entre- <laughs> surprise, surprise, honey. You never get away from the boss until you figure out how to make passive income. And we'll talk about that in another episode yes. once I start making the passive yes. income I want. But uh-huh. um, right now I can't talk to you yeah. about that, but I will be able to. But until you're able to figure out how to make passive income, mm-hmm. you will always mm-hmm. have a boss. Mm-hmm. Like right now, you know, I have sponsors mm-hmm. for my events, right? Mm-hmm. And though they're not technically my boss, technically in some, you know, they they have some responsibility to them. Yeah. I have responsibility to them. They have to be able to trust that what I tell them I'm going to deliver on, I'm going to deliver on. By any means necessary. By any means necessary. And let me tell you, by any means necessary, I'm going to deliver. Yeah. Bottom line, point blank, they don't have to think about it. Yeah. And I think they feel a sense of comfort in that because they know mm-hmm. that what Branda says she's going to do, she's yeah. going to do it. Yeah. It's going to be done. Yeah. And so no matter what, you're going to have a boss. Your boss is going to be your customers. Your customers yeah. are going to have to be able to trust you. They're going to have to know that no matter what, you're going to go over and beyond for them. So let's recap. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all, you know what that means? Her stomach must be growling. That's what that is. No, because, but honestly, the passion, seriously, it has to be there when you are ripe for entrepreneurship. So these signs that we said, number one is being an entrepreneur on your job. It's so important that you take on ownership, internal ownership of what you do and how you meet the outcomes so that you can take that same level of ownership and optimize it when you're outside of whatever space you're in. If it's corporate or if you're leaving college or um, you're in retirement and returning to work, whatever that space is, or even or you're a mompreneur and you're like creating time to build, it's especially important to have that entrepreneurship on your, in your in whatever you're already doing and you make it come alive um, outside of it. That makes you ripe. Number two is having a mission in front of you, like being very clear on what it is that you want to accomplish, like the outcomes that you think you are going to bring to the table that people can come to expect from you. What is that? What's that global mission that you are seeking to accomplish? Um, number three You guys have to excuse Brandis is blowing her nose in the uh, background. But (laughs) number three um, is your your motive. You know, are you leaving your job out of frustration or because there are unfulfilled passions? So it's about understanding like your motive behind entrepreneurship and making sure that your motives are clear. Uh, Number four is are you consistent, dependable, reliable, curious? Um, and energized, meaning are you outstanding? Because if you're outstanding there at your job or wherever you are in your space in life, you're going to be outstanding as an entrepreneur. And number five, are you willing to sacrifice the time, the money, the resources, the personal interest in exchange for the investment in your business? If you are, we guarantee you that if you do it consistently and steadily and aggressively, it comes with reward. And sometimes the reward is short term, is long term, whatever it is, you're going to reap and you will reap bountifully whatever you sow bountifully. So hopefully we've given you something you can chew on yeah. and something to consider. This was good. I think it was good. And I, I mean, we could go on and on and on, but we got to we gotta feed the machine. <laughs> we got to feed the machine. So we want to thank our families. I would thank my husband, Kwaku. He is the bomb.com yes. and I love him dearly. Yes, and I want to thank my boo, Rich Daniel, who's about to be a daddy. Aw, that's so sweet. <laughs> Papa Rich. And, and we want to thank our kids. We got baby love, bacon in the oven, yes. Sam and Dylan, our moms, dads, uncles, cousins, cousins, brothers, sisters around the world. Absolutely. And thank all of you guys. Please make sure you visit our website. At thegreatgirlfriends.com. Our Facebook page. The Great Girlfriends. Our Twitter. Which is the underscore. Great. Great. GFS. GFS. <laughs> <laughs> um, Instagram. The great girlfriend. Post your questions on our website. Share with friends. Yes, leave reviews on iTunes. Please go on iTunes and leave reviews. All right, and keep listening and, and keep, keep being a great, great girlfriend. girlfriend. Signing off. Bye, guys.